I would like to invite those of you who would like to do so to join with me in opening this evening um, with this karakia. Tukuna te wairua ki a rere ki ngā taumata. Whaia te te kanga a rātoma. Hei arahi i a mātoumahi. Pupuri ki ngā whakaaro ki a whakamana. I ngā tangata, ki a māo, ki a ita. Ki a whakamaua, ki a tina. Tina. Haumie, huie, taikie. E ngā mana, e ngā reo, rā ranga tēra mā. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. The karakia we opened with was gifted to the Lickens Institute by Michael Stedman, Ngāti Whātua Orake, Kaiara Taki Waipapa Tomatoro, at the instigation of Professor O'Sullivan, who was responsible for taking that initiative forward. My name is Frank Bloomfield, I'm director of the Liggins Institute, and it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon to a very special occasion um, for Professor O'Sullivan's inaugural professorial lecture. Before we start, just a few housekeeping. Please um, turn your phones off, or at least to silent. Toilets are outside across the atrium and also down the corridor to the right as you go out of the doors at the back there. And if there should be an emergency, the red lights will flash and water will come out of the ceilings. And um, please leave by the exits at the back there, or there are also some emergency exits at the front. Now, the format for an inaugural lecture doesn't include questions and answers at the end. But as you all have come in, you'll have noticed that people are setting up outside. So I'd like to invite you all to join us afterwards um, for a drink and some nibbles to celebrate um, Justin's inaugural lecture. In addition, um, the lecture will be recorded and will be available on the Liggins website. So I'd particularly like to welcome you all here again tonight. Um, welcome to the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, Professor Jim Metzen, to colleagues of Justin, collaborators, not only from the sciences, but also from the arts, I see that Billy Apple is here tonight, to one of Justin's supervisors from his doctoral degree, Howard Jenkinson, welcome, to Justin's students, and of course particularly to Justin's family, to Eugene and Brenda, Simon, Alice, James, and of course Gina. A very warm welcome to you all. So an inaugural lecture provides a way to celebrate the recognition by the university of the mark of distinction conferred by promotion to professor, which is the highest academic rank. And tonight, of course, we're here to celebrate that for Professor Justin O'Sullivan with his lecture from the mouth to the genes and back again, a discussion of complex diseases. And if you're wondering what that means, so am I. Um, but I'm sure Justin will enlighten us over the course of the next hour. Now, Professor O'Sullivan has chosen to deliver his lecture in academic regalia. And this mode of apparel dates back to the 12th century, when all academics were in religious orders. And of course, the gown comes from the original Kappa Clausa, which was a development of the priestly pluvial. The hoods covered the tonsured heads of the clergy. And for a while, in some institutions, the way that um, professors were promoted was the applicant would stand at the front um, with his back to the rest of the staff and the staff would drop little pieces of paper with an I or an A into the hood and then they'd be counted after the person turned round. Unfortunately, I don't think that form of torture has been used at the University of Auckland before. In the 14th century, um, some, the statutes of some of the English colleges forbade excess apparel um, and prescribed the wearing of long gowns which were closed and they still are in some American university, and that was to prevent the display of excessive finery. The gown that um, Justin's wearing this evening is the doctoral degree from the University of Otago, and I think it's a great shame that it's not um, a closed gown, because then it would hide the fact that Justin is not wearing a tie. <laughs> <laughs> the um, specific details for academic regalia were really introduced at the time of Henry VIII by the Universities of Cambridge and Oxford, and most regalia in New Zealand are based upon these. Um, but the current convention of 
specific colours representing areas of study is a much more recent introduction. But now, of course, to turn to Professor O'Sullivan, who joined the Institute in 2012 from Massey University, where he was a senior lecturer in the Institute of Molecular Biosciences. And prior to that, he took a first class degree, Bachelor of Science in Cellular and Molecular Biology from the University of Canterbury, Canterbury and then a PhD from Otago University. The University of Auckland assesses promotion to professor on criteria covering research, teaching, and service, with the key requirement being international reputation and eminence in the field. And in my view, Justin sails over the bar on all of these counts. His research is world leading, and his original and innovative thinking is reflected in the work he's done on the spatial organization and regulation of the genome, the mapping of regulatory genes in polygenic disorders, and his investigations into the microbiome, its transmission between people, whether mother to baby or peer to peer, and the interaction between the microbiome and the host. He has over 90 peer-reviewed publications, and a particular note is that these are all in quality journals, including Nature Communications, Cell, Nucleic Acids Research, and Microbiome, and several of his papers have made the front cover. He's been highly successful in obtaining research funding from a wide range of organizations, including the Health Research Council of New Zealand, the Royal Society, Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Enterprise, and international funding such as the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And he's also received substantial support from philanthropists, which reflects his gift for communi communicating science with passion but clarity and his ability to enthuse others with his ideas, as well as reflecting his world-leading research. And I'm delighted particularly to welcome some of the philanthropists who have supported Justin throughout his career here tonight. Their contribution not only supports the research advances that Justin makes, but of course their generosity also has played a key role in fostering the success of Justin's career. Justin also is an outstanding academic citizen, contributing widely both nationally and internationally in his field and also to the University of Auckland. His international reputation is reflected in honorary professorships at the University of Southampton and the Garvin Institute, in addition to the numerous invitations to speak at international conferences around the world. In 2016, Justin was appointed Associate Director, Research, and in 2020, Deputy Director of the Liggins Institute. These are both large roles requiring substantial commitment, and yet Justin has maintained his research output and his student supervision. He is known around the university for his positive, insightful, and constructive contributions and his ability to cut to the chase. And this is reflected in the fact that it's extremely difficult to persuade committee chairs to let him step down. For me personally, working with Justin in the leadership team of the Institute has been hugely enjoyable and a real privilege. He has enormous energy and enthusiasm, sometimes enough to leave me feeling utterly exhausted and is a real cauldron of ideas and initiatives. And I sometimes wonder how he ever gets to sleep at night. So I'd like to thank Justin for his support for me in my role as director as well as, as a collaborator and for his tremendous contributions to the Liggins Institute. Finally, of course, Justin is a superlative supervisor of postgraduate students. And I think that he would agree that for him, this is the most important contribution he makes to supervising um, his students, and he cares deeply for them. And I thought that rather than me telling you about his relationship with his students, I would let the students do that for me. Busy, enthusiastic, ambitious, 
protein. <laughs> Um, I want to sit down now and listen to that guy. Um, <laughs> instead, uh, you got me, uh, so uh, I'll do my best. Um, thanks very much for coming. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here talking to you today. Um, it's been a long time coming, um, but uh, they kind of stole my thunder because there's more to me than you see. Um, and so this is me with my, my daughter, who doesn't look like us anymore, she's grown up. Um, and this is my family. And uh, so without them, you know, I wouldn't be me. Uh, and they support me uh, through my trip, and it's been really cool. So thank you. But I am really a face for many. And the many people that I'm faces for are these people. I'm just the front, and these are the people who do everything that I'm going to show you and that we've published. So these are all the the people that have worked with me over the years. Uh, this is me uh, wearing a hat that Billy gave me uh, one Christmas, uh, which is quite cool. I um, mean, these are the other people that support me as well, um, and other people in the Institute, uh, through the Institute, um, and often we forget to recognise the great deal of help that they give us, and I'd like to thank them as well. These are all my co-authors and collaborators. And I know that I haven't missed anybody out on this list, because what I did was I took um, all 100 papers, I've got a few more since Frank counted, um, <laughs> but all 100 papers, and I grabbed all of the authors off the list, and then I put them in a wordle, and so this is everybody. And you can see by the sizes uh, here, these are, the size basically says the number of papers, it reflects the number of papers I've published with people. So people like William have been really essential um, in my career. Uh, William has been working with me now for nearly half of my career. Um, it's been amazing, and thank you. Uh, but others as well, so there's a few other people here who get a number of mentions through this talk. But also my funders, because without funders, you know, we can't do any of the work that we do. And uh, it's been amazing uh, to get the support that I've got <coughs> from the funding community. Um, even though I know, I know sometimes my, my father, he says to me, he doesn't really understand why we would bother sending grants to our competitors and having them say whether or not we should get funded. It seems kind of a weird thing. Um, and in some respects it is, but you know, that's the way the system works and so that's what we do. But I would like to thank all of these people and the funding bodies here. So my journey started in Canterbury, because uh, I'm Cantabrian. Uh, many of you will know that because I, I support the Crusaders very strongly. And of course, um, down to the point that the ribbons I'm going to use later are red and black. Um, you know, so you have to do it, really. Can't support the other teams. Uh, but my journey started uh, in Canterbury uh, with these people. So this is Barry Palmer and this is Jackie Aislaby. And they took me on as an honours student um, way back then um, to actually study uh, how bacteria degrade di uh, dibenzothiophene. I actually looked for some images from my, from my honours thesis, but I, I seem to have lost it. Um, <laughs> I don't think it was that good, actually. Um, so I, I studied this with them, 
Um, and I got honours. And I always remember, and Barry spoke to me uh, uh, after, and he said, you know, uh, he said, uh, a few decisions went your way. Um, and that was good, because they thought I might be able to do some science that, that contributed. So that was cool. And I want to thank them for that. Um, and so I got my honours uh, first class in, in 1994. And I moved from studying bacteria and how bacteria degrade these chemicals that, that basically contaminate sites of gas works and petroleum um, uh, work, uh, and moved on. And I moved to the mouth. And so this is the beginning of the mouth. And so what I did was, um, I actually got offered a position in medical school, and I thought about it, but I also got offered a position um, in Otago at the dental school uh, with these people. And so Howard Jenkinson is here, and he was one of my supervisors, and Richard Cannon was my other. And Brian here, he used to advise me um, about things, and it was quite good. And I studied in a dental school, um, which is kind of an unusual place to do a PhD, as some people might think. Um, but what I studied there was, I actually studied this organism here, and this is a yeast, and it's um, Candida albicans. And so Candida albicans causes thrush, um, which used to be a real killer at parties. Um, <laughs> But, um, <clears throat> but it was all right, you know, because I didn't study. I studied this form of thrush, which was the one that <laughs> binds in your mouth, right? And it was a real problem. And what I studied with thrush here was about how it actually sticks in your mouth and how it binds to your mouth. And so we developed some assays, and the assays were kind of cool, but basically what we did is we fed the yeast radioactive methionine, and it ate it up, and it put it into proteins, and then we used the yeast basically to bind to salivary proteins, and we could see which salivary proteins it bound to. And it was a pretty cool trick, really. Um, and it gave us some real neat um, papers. Um, and I wanted to show this one, uh, mostly for Chris, because um, I actually did mass spec work um, during my PhD, which is kind of something that slips through. Um, but then, when I'd done my PhD, which was, was an amazing journey, um, but when I'd done that, I, I moved back to Canterbury. Um, but I didn't move to Canterbury, in Christchurch in Canterbury. I moved to um, Canterbury uh, in the UK. Um, so I just went all the way around the world just to go back to Canterbury. <laughs> Unusual, but that's what I did. And I went there and I worked with, uh, with Mick. Um, and so I applied for this job. I remember applying for this job. It was, it was advertised in Nature. And so I, I sent my application in and um, had an interview with him on the phone. And I didn't get the job. And I said, oh, well. I said, that's all right, mate. I said, um, I'm going to come anyway and have a look and I just have a look in the UK. So I come over and, and do you mind if I stop off at your lab and have a look? And he turned around and he rang me back uh, a few days later and he said, yeah, you've got the job. <laughs> so <clears throat> having never met Mick, um, I remember getting to Canterbury and I had, I had my backpack and, 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 uh, and, a, and like a little bag, um, just a duffel bag. And I walked in and he was on the stairs and that was the first time I'd ever met him. And so that was kind of cool. And so with Mick, I did something different. And Mick was, was really into Candida albicans, a very, very important organism, of course. Um, but he's also into this, the genetic code. And so the genetic code is the way we read, or the way organisms read, DNA. And all of the information that we have is stored in our DNA. Well, not all of it, right, but, but most of it. And the genetic code is this code which is made up of three letters. And it's a redundant code, and there are no commas, there's no things. It's just a three-letter code. And it's universal. Well, we think it's universal. But the reality of it is, is that it's not universal. In fact, even in your own cells, mitochondria don't use this code. So mitochondria use a different code to what your nuclear cells do. Well, your nuclear, not your cells, your nucleus does. And so, in fact, there are a number of reassignments in the genetic code, whereby the organisms, or the, the particular organism you're looking at, uses a different code to what we would consider the universal. And most of those reassignments, this, this here's the, the universal code, so for example, this codon codes for a stop, but in this particular organism, mycoplasma, right, it encodes a tryptophan. And here, most of them are either stops to tryptophans or stops to another amino acid or the other way around. A few of them are arginine, or this is isoleucine, sorry, to methionine, or something else, or arginine to tryptophan, but they occur mostly in mitochondria. And the reason is mitochondria have very small genomes. They don't code for very many proteins, right? They used to be bacteria, but now they're not. But if you change one of these things, you've got to think about it. 
It's like going through a book and taking every A in the book, or every word the, and just replacing it with another word. So we went through the book and just took out the and replaced it with sit, for example. And it would mess up your reading of that book phenomenally. So when you change something like this, you have a huge impact on the organism, right? It's a real big deal. Well, these ones mostly change stops to something else. So that's like replacing your full stop with a word. You figure that out pretty quick. But candida doesn't. Candida is a little beastie. And what it did was it changed this codon from a leucine to a serine. That's a whole reassignment, right? And you're changing from one type of amino acid to a different type of amino acid. Completely different properties in every protein in that organism. When it made that change, it was a huge impact on the organism. In fact, Candida's really weird, so it actually did it twice. It, it reassigned it, and then it went back, and then it reassigned it again. Really weird, right? Massive impact on the organism. So this was a really important thing to study. And so we did this, and we studied it, and we did some things, and we showed that the enzyme, the serial tRNA synthetase, which is the enzyme that actually puts the amino acid on this molecule, a tRNA, what reads, reads as part of the reading mechanism, that that wasn't responsible. And in fact, what was responsible was actually a change in the structure of the tRNA molecule itself, which is really, really cool. So we did that there. Um, but then after about three years, uh, Mick had had enough of me. Um, and so I left. And um, I left there, and I was quite interested in DNA. And I was looking for a job. And so I went around a couple of places. I went up to Manchester. Um, but I'd always wanted to go to Oxford. And, and I got offered an interview with a guy in Oxford, um, Nick Proudfoot. And Nick worked in the Sir William Dunn School of Pathology. A really, really, really great man, um, and he taught me a lot. Now, and Nick was quite famous, and he always gave me a hard time, um, because he sequenced a piece of DNA, just a little piece of DNA. So during his PhD, he sequenced a piece of DNA. And he always used to hassle me, because I'd just seen my DNA wafer sequencing. And he used to hassle me that you're not a real scientist until you've sequenced it yourself and done it on a gel and run it out and counted the bands and stuff. So when I finally sequenced an entire organism, I wrote back to him and said, I haven't done it by doing it in a gel, but I have sequenced this organism 20 times. Uh, he never said anything. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but Nick, so he was really good. So Nick was really interested in transcription and in controlling transcription. And so while I was there, this is a photograph from my lab book, um, we were working um, on, just, just to show the, the people in my lab that I actually did do work in the lab once. Um, <laughs> we were working on trying to understand how transcription occurs. That's a process of reading a gene, right? Actually going along, and the enzyme goes along and reads the gene and produces a molecule that goes out of the nucleus and it gets translated. So we were designing this assay, which was a really long gene in yeast, this big gene here, and it's like 8,000 base pairs long, it's huge, um, in yeast. And I was running these assays, again, uh, focused on radioactive stuff, right? And we were looking at this, and I was looking at these things, and when you get used to reading these, which you won't in the two seconds you're going to see it, um, you realize that the, the enzyme peaks in the middle and towards the end of the gene. And that was cool. But one day, Nick and I were sitting there, and we were, I was sitting there, he was standing behind me, um, and we were looking at this one. And this one here is really interesting. You have to believe me. Um, <laughs> this one's interesting because the situation here on the left is doing something completely wrong. The one on the left shouldn't have signal across it at all, and it shouldn't have signal at the end and the end, and that's what it does. So we were sitting there, and I was thinking, well, this is wrong. And Nick said, well, he likes to say he said, but he said, what if the two ends have come together and it's looped? And that was that. And so, in fact, we went on and we showed that, in fact, in this particular situation, the gene forms a loop. And that was really the beginning of the journey that I've been on ever since. Because after that point, we got interested in how DNA forms the structures inside cells, when it loops, what it interacts with, and what that actually means in terms of how it works. Because the information in DNA is not just 
held in the sequence of adenines and thymines and cytosines and guanines, the ATCG that we all know. It's held also in the structure of it, the three-dimensional structure, the way it folds, the way it changes. And this is where that came from. And so this is, um, I think, still my most cited paper. Um, and it's really cool, uh, although one Brooks had done recently is, is catching that up. But then I got the chance to come home, uh, back to New Zealand, and I had a young family at this point. Gina had finally said that she'd marry me. Um, so, you know, we did, and we came home with our daughter. Um, and we came back, and I got a job here at Massey University uh, in Albany, which is, you know, it's just over the road here, right? Well, not over the road, but over the bridge and a little way up the road. And so I got a job there, uh, and Dave Lambert and Pat Sullivan um, hired me to go in there. Uh, Pat's just coming here, actually. Yeah, thank you. And um, Pat came, and, and they hired me, and they took me into this job at Massey. Not, not in this nice building, mind. Um, in this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, wasn't, it wasn't that good, so I went in here. And so I got taken into this building, which was a really cool lab, actually, at the time. And we set up a lab, and we started working there. And so while I was there, I was influenced a lot by a number of other people. Um, I don't know if they're here, but, but Barry Scott, um, Grant Guilford, and Gavin Martin. Um, one day, um, Gavin sat me down, and he said to me, Justin, he said, it's not just about big papers, he said. You have to publish other papers as well. Don't just go for the really big ones. Publish consistently. And that, that was the lesson that, that he gave me, and I do thank him for that. Um, but while I was there, I started working on looping. And I'll show you that in a second. And I, as I did, um, I met a couple of very long-term collaborators. Um, Julie Horsfield, who's from Otago, and Austin Ganley, who's sitting up the back here as well, who's now at, at um, SBS. So while I was there, I'd just come back from Oxford. I thought everything was great. I started doing some work, and I went into a period where I had a few years where I didn't publish anything. And, and that was pretty hard. Um, but during that time, uh, what I did do was I set up a project um, with Austin's help, um, which we called the Kartoa Metagenomics Project, which was for schools. And so we went out to schools and we had them basically sample soil across New Zealand and in their backyards and all over the place and actually extract DNA from it and do metagenomics, or well, actually it was 16 years amplicon sequencing, but look at the bacteria that were present in the soil across New Zealand. And we got the kids to do it, and this is one of the, the first real sort of DNA sequencing projects that kids did. And it was really cool, it was a really great project, and it ran for, for several years, and about a thousand kids went through that program. And it was supported by various charities, it was awesome. Um, but I also uh, got my first Marsden grant. And um, I got that the year I came, actually, which was pretty cool. And it was a fast start grant. And so I'll show you uh, some of it. Um, the grant, I think, was pretty well written. Uh, I like to think that, you know. <laughs> but uh, it had this cool figure in it. It was about DNA looping. And uh, the really bright idea we had was um, to study the looping of the ribosomal DNA. And the ribosome is really important, right? It reads things, that's how proteins are made. But the DNA for it is kind of complicated because it exists in these big arrays of genes, about 200 in a row. Well, I ignored that. And I thought, well, I'll draw this cool picture and it will show the, the repeats. And then I'll draw this one about how it might loop up inside the cell, and that's nice. And then this one here about how I'm going to study it, which is a method that we actually use, which is kind of cool, so that worked. Uh, and this one about what we think is going on. I got given the money, and then, whoops, um, it didn't work. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I forgot the fact that the DNA is arranged in this massive array, and that makes it really hard to study by this method because all of the different ones are very, very similar and so you couldn't really do it. But what it did do was it led me to this. And so this little kid, if you were to take this kid, not that you can, and blend them up and take all of their DNA out and extract it all, right, then the DNA from this child would go from the earth to the sun and back, if you lined it all up end to end, 133 times. That's how much DNA there is in them, right? It'd be pretty small, we still wouldn't be able to see the thickness of it, but it would get there and back 133 times. And that's a lot of DNA. There's two meters of DNA inside every one of your cells, except for the sort of 70% of your cells that are red blood cells, because they don't have any. But the other cells, they do. Two meters of DNA. And that DNA is squished and folded and packed into those nuclei. And when it does that, 
it still has to be readable and accessible. The information in it has got to come out. And so this led us to this. It's a pretty simple concept, right? He's two metres tall, and if you watch, and don't cringe too much, um, he packs himself into this jar, right? <laughs> and that's what your DNA does, but even more than that, right? Because the cell that the DNA packs into, he's about two metres tall, the cell the DNA packs into is, you can't even see it, right? So imagine that, you know, and doing this. It's, it's just phenomenal. And so, you know, it takes a lot of bending and twisting, a lot of folding to get inside this cell, right? <coughs> Eventually he'll get there. Yeah, I've seen it before. Yeah. <laughs> so, here we go. Oh, he's got to do something weird with his arm now. Yeah, he does that. <coughs> and there you go. And so, you squash it in. So you're squashing your DNA into a cell just like that, right? Imagine that. The impact is amazing. So we worked out a method to do this. And the method that we worked out to do it is really very simple, and I'll illustrate it to you now very quickly. So if you have two chromosomes, uh, and you're from Canterbury, and one's red and one's black, and those two chromosomes, they contact themselves at some point here like this, so that there's actually a complex holding them together, okay? Well, there's a way that you can take chemicals, in this case the ball clip, and put it, and it will join them together so that they can't be separated, okay? Physically, they are covalently linked, right? Can't separate them. Then, what you can do is you can rip all the DNA out of the cell, and you can take scissors, molecular scissors, right? But you can take them, and you cut the DNA up. Right? And when you cut the DNA up, apparently I have to clean up after myself, so I'm only going to cut it twice. When you cut the DNA up, right, these bits stay stuck together. Okay, they can't move away from each other, because they are physically bound. But... The cool trick is that there's another enzyme which is called a ligase, and its job is to actually stick DNA back together. So you put the DNA ligase in, and it joins the ends that are, well, it should join the ends. <laughs> Sometimes it does miss fire, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's no good. It's a, it's a cheap, uh, the, the staples are bending, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me do it another way. Okay, so the, the stapler has done this, okay? Um, and what you do then is you remove the complex that's holding it together. Okay, and so when the complex that's holding it together goes away, the ligase has joined it so that the red chromosome now is joined directly to the black one, right? And what we can do is we can then do sequencing. And we just sequence from here across here. And when we do that, of course, the sequence changes from being on the black chromosome to all of a sudden being on the red chromosome at a junction, a restriction enzyme site that we know we cut at. And that means that the red chromosome and the black chromosome at those points, or those two restriction fragments, must have been physically together in space, right? And that's it. It's really simple because you can do it with ribbons. And it does and it works a treat. Now if you do that in yeast, you get this complex mix like this, right? And this shows all of the interactions that are occurring between the different chromosomes for the yeast. All right, and it's really cool, and this was a great paper that was done by Chris um, and Geert here. And, the, and they did this paper with me way back then, and it was nice. But the point of this is this. If you get away from that sort of spider web drawing that I showed you, and you think about it like this, and you've got two chromosomes, and you have some sites on those two chromosomes, and you squash those chromosomes up so they fit inside the cell, and then you take that and cut that open, what actually happens is that those sites that you had that you thought were separate can come together in three dimensions. And so the spider web that I showed you is kind of useful in some ways, but you really need to think about it like this. Because now, you see these chromosomes here, or these regions of these chromosomes, are all contacting this particular element, despite the fact that that element wasn't on each part of those chromosomes. You see what I mean? And that's the key. Because if you understand that, you can start to understand how things are working inside the nucleus. So, we did another paper, and this is Tatiana, and she said some nice things about me uh, on the video, um, which is very, very nice of her. Uh, but um, here she is, and what she did was she made these models, and she actually showed that where things are matters. And so these are where the origins of replication are inside uh, a different yeast. This is a, a fission yeast. Um, and so it shows that these ones that shoot, or these are origins of replication, so it's the point where the DNA starts to replicate. 
And the ones that work all the time are in the centre, the ones that don't work are out towards the edges, and in fact there's other things about the efficiency, but I won't go into that. And she showed that where things were actually does matter. And this is really important, it was a, the first one to show that, and it was a really nice paper, and we even, it's, I'm very proud of this one too because um, it's the only paper I have where I published with a Nobel laureate um, as one of the minor authors, which was really cool. <laughs> um, and so we figured that out, and that was cool, but we also realised that what we were capturing was actually a composite of structure. And the easy way to show that is this, right? Each cell that we were capturing something from was in a bulk culture. And it's like watching a game of rugby. So Ma'a Nonu here, he was in this stance at the beginning of the, co of, of the game. Uh, he was in this stance uh, during the game, uh, just passing the ball here. Uh, here he's trying to fend off an Englishman, which is good. And here he's scoring a try, right? And each of those points, he's in a different stance, a different phase of the game. And the models that we were doing and the things that we were capturing captured all of those things and all of those structures. So in fact, what they were capturing was the essence of Ma'a, but is this which meant that the structure we were getting is this. Now, I'm pretty sure in all the games I saw, Ma'a never existed in that one particular confirmation. And so we had to realize that and move on. And so we did. And so one day, um, I was sitting in my office at Massey. Um, I had a little office there, it, you know, it was cool. Um, and I was sitting there and I got this phone call. And uh, the phone call was Wayne. And Wayne said, um, do you want to come and have a cup of coffee and have a chat about a job? And I said, yeah, sure. Um, so I borrowed the Massey car and I drove. <laughs> <coughs> and I drove to the coffee shop and I had a chat with Wayne. Uh, and that was cool. It, it, you know, it was nice to talk to Wayne. And then I had an interview with, with the rest of the uh, institute at a point, which was a little bit um, more intimidating. Um, <laughs> but it was great, right? And so I, I got the job. Uh, which is really cool. And so I came here, and all of these people, um, I've had a lot of work that I've done with these people at the Institute, uh, and they've all been really great help to me um, over the time I've been here, so thank you. Um, but since I came to the Institute, I focused on two things. Uh, one thing was the spatial DNA structure that I've been talking about, and the second thing is the microbiome. Um, and so it's kind of going back. But one thing, and I'll just show you very quickly, because uh, this is kind of a bit of a sideline, but is, is interesting, was that um, a few years back, I don't know how long it was now, but um, we were interested in mitochondria. And uh, Jack Black, uh, he is actually the, the, the face of the mitochondrial uh, charity. So he supports a mitochondrial charity. And he was coming to New Zealand um, to do a concert. And so we thought, oh, that'd be cool. Let's see if we can meet Jack Black. And so we made a little story about mitochondria. And uh, what it was is basically mitochondria are their own little organelles, they're the powerhouses of your cell, right? And they sit in the cell, they make all this energy, and they do all these other things too. But we showed that they communicate with the nucleus by DNA. And you can think about it like this, it's like having a band split between two places. And of course it was Tenacious D were coming, and so we thought, oh yeah, we'll split it up. So we set it up like this. So part of the band isn't here, even though Tenacious D didn't have a guitar, uh, a, a, a pianist and a, and a drummer, and we put M Jack Black in the, in the mitochondria. And so we said, well, look, you know, if they're here and they're all playing their own tune, it doesn't work very well, right? Um, you really need a conductor. And so it goes back to that movie, The School of Rock, which Jack Black was in. So we said, well, he's, he's like the conductor. So the mitochondria is the conductor, which was what we were thinking. So if it's all working, then the cell's happy and the music's good. And that's cool. If it's not, and everyone's playing their own tune, it's a bit of a raucous mess, right? And it is. And the cell dies. But if one of them goes off on their own, then you end up with something like this, right? Where basically you've got someone doing their own thing, and again, the cell proliferates, but it doesn't work. So we made that little PowerPoint, and we sent it to Jack Black, and he sent us back tickets, so we went and had a beer with him after the match. <laughs> This was really cool, so that was actually yeah, one of the most memorable things. Um, so our goal, of course, wasn't just to meet Jack Black, but it was to use DNA sequencing, and it is to use DNA sequencing, to move from a genetic association to pathway-based understanding of complex disease. We want to understand why the variants that we all have and how the variants that we all have put us at risk of developing complex diseases. 
Now, it sounds like a simple question, and for years, people have been studying this question. And the way they've studied it is by doing genome-wide association studies. And it sounds complicated, but I'll explain it very simply. If you take a population, in this case, it's a population of ladies, and some of them are wearing brown capes and others aren't, okay? And the brown cape is the phenotype. But if we take this population of people and we split them into the group that don't have the capes and the group that do have the capes, then we've separated them according to their phenotype. What we can do then is we can sequence their DNA or parts of their DNA. And if we sequence their DNA, what we find are that this group have a particular base at this position. So here they generally have an A at this position in their DNA. Whereas this group down here with the brown capes, they have a T in their DNA at this position. Exactly the same position, but the A is changed to a T. So that means that the T is associated with wearing the brown cape, if you think about it really simply, okay? And that's called a genome-wide association study. Now these sorts of studies have been done for a huge number of complex diseases, all right? And that's real cool, because over time, we've come to understand the positions in the genome where changes are actually associated with disease. In fact, this is it, all right? And if you watch the graph, you'll see the huge number of positions that are associated with these disorders, different disorders, right? Now, when you look at it like this, it doesn't mean anything, all right? It's just impressive that there's that many spots. But what we're trying to do is understand what each one of those spots does and how it actually links to a disease. The easiest thing would be if it was each one of those mutations or changes was present in a gene. That would be simple, right? Because then it's inactivating the gene. When you inactivate the gene, you cause the disease, right? It's a very deterministic way of thinking about it, but that would be it. Very, very simple. Unfortunately, 93% of them don't fall inside genes. In fact, they fall inside what used to be called junk DNA, right? People don't like that term, neither do I much, but it's a term that a lot of people understand not inside the genes, but in the, in the rest of the DNA. And if it's not in a gene, what's it doing? And so what we've done, and William and others have been very critical in this, is we've studied a toy. And so this toy here is, is a pitch switch ball, right? And so what it does is, well, it's a ball. Um, unless, oh, I didn't do it. I throw it. And then it opens and refolds. Exactly the same material, just a different conformation. And now it's a different colored ball, right? And your DNA can do that. But when it does that in different cells, you go from a green cell to an orange cell, just for simple, like a liver cell to a brain cell or, or something else. When it does that, it brings particular points into contact with genes, as I showed you with the plasticine. Bringing those points into contact means that they can act to regulate the genes that they are physically associated with in space. So in this conformation, this controls these three genes, but when I flip it, it doesn't. Now this one's controlling these three genes, okay? Real simple. So we figured out that this might be the case, that in fact, well, along, other people did too, but, but we did. Um, but we showed that some of the mutations, these disease-associated mutations, actually fall in regions that act as switches for genes. And the way those switches work is you bring them in contact with the gene, they're going to turn on, okay? And that's really cool, because it works like this. And there will be a lot of this tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And so this is how it works, very simply, right? When you bring something into contact, it either turns the gene on, in this case, it's turning it off, right? And stopping its function. Very nice, very simple. So we moved to understand that. And the example I'll show you is this. So this is a gene called glucose rebrosidase. It's a gene, sorry, it encodes the glucose rebrosidase. And this is a very important enzyme in your brain. And it's linked to idiopathic Parkinson's disease, all right, and Gelsh's disease. Very horrible disorders that, that, that yeah, we just hope we don't get. This gene uh, here is the one that's thought to be the culprit. And what we did is, what Sophie, sorry, and William did, right, William led this one, but what William and Sophie did is they ran across this gene here and they took every common genetic variant in this region and they asked, what do those common genetic variants contact in three dimensions 
Okay, so what do they contact? Is it a gene? And do they actually change the expression of that gene? Can they turn it on or do they turn it off? And they did that for these. And they found that, hey, look, there's a whole lot of regions across here that do, that control different genes. Not just the gene that they're sitting in, GBA, and not just the genes next to it, but genes that are on other chromosomes in your DNA. A lot of interesting things about these genes, a lot of pathways that they're involved in that actually link to Parkinson's disease. So we think that GBA is acting like a central regulator for Parkinson's, that it has a whole lot of things it's doing that can modify the onset of Parkinson's disease. And in fact, what we showed, and what William and Sophie showed very nicely uh, with Martin Kennedy, and this is Anthony Cooper, who's at the Garvin, our collaborators, what they showed beautifully is this, that if you separate according to the number of types of switch you have, okay, this switch here works, all right, and we have two copies of this switch in this particular thing. This one here, we have two copies of the broken switch. I should have put that there. Here, this is your age at diagnosis, all right? So 67 years at diagnosis if you have the broken switch, 61 years at diagnosis if you have the active switch. Okay? That's a big deal. Age of onset for the Parkinson's again shows the same pattern. And this is really important, okay? This is called a dosage thing because this one's a heterozygote, okay? So it's a dosage relationship. And so basically what this is showing is this. That when we have this one, we're flicking the switch and we're controlling these other genes, even though these particular mutations are not inside the gene itself. They're in the junk DNA, if you want to call it that. Not that I would, but it's easy, which is a problem with it. But if you've broken the switch, or a component of the switch, which is what we're talking about, then when you bring that into 3D with the gene you're trying to control, it doesn't work, right? Because imagine turning the switch on with that finger. And so Sophie has gone further than this, and she's actually taken a piece of the DNA, and she's put it in an artificial construct to show that, in fact, when we have the proper switch, we get a lot of, this is just basically light. So this assay measures and generates a whole lot of light. You get a whole lot of light when you've got this switch. When you've got that switch, you don't get so much light because it's pretty painful to turn it on. And so it's really important because it means that there's something going on here. And we don't really understand this yet because we, <laughs> yeah, we don't. Um, but we know that it's to do with the switch. We're just trying to figure out what's going on, what it's controlling, where it's important, and that works ongoing. But what we do know is that this replicates across cohorts. And one of the important things about that is this is a Dutch cohort, and here we have the broken switch again, and you see it's exactly the same pattern. And here we have the good switch. So a good switch means you get Parkinson's early, bad switch means you don't. And if you conglomerate the data, okay, so that means if we mix data sources from people who are diagnosed in, by normal clinicians or people who are diagnosed by movement specialist disorder clinicians, if we take those different cohorts and we mix it all together, then you end up with a relationship on the right, okay? And here you'll see that's not the same, okay? And that's because people are diagnosing things that they think are Parkinson's or a version of Parkinson's, a different version of Parkinson's, and it's mixing it up, and we don't see this relationship. So it's very important how you do that. Okay, but we think that basically everybody, we all have millions of mutations in our DNA, okay? Those millions of mutations, those millions of differences between you and me and everybody in this room put us all at risk of developing a genetic disorder. And just how much just depends on how many of those changes you've got and what they're affecting. But there's going to be an environmental figure, a trigger, sorry, and it's going to affect the development of the disease. Okay. So Daniel here has been working on this uh, for Parkinson's, and this is another really interesting thing. Um, and he's been able to use some machine learning to actually talk about and look at which tissues might be important for the development of Parkinson's. So you would think the tissues that are important for Parkinson's development would be the brain. Pretty straightforward, right? In fact, it's not, it's the heart. Um, here, this is the top ranking ones, a piece of the heart that people actually often cut out um, during some surgeries because if you cut it out, it stops you having atrial fibrillation, it stops your blood pressure going up and down. Well, actually, that piece of your heart is really important, we think, for Parkinson's. But we don't know how. So, these contacts that we have, some of these contacts that we have, 
um, can have very delayed effects. All right? I'm sure that Ruben Wiki uh, wishes that this picture never existed. Um, and that's what's happening. So we, we know that the effects are very much dependent on the time when they occur and these switches are working. Okay? And so Eugenia has been doing this for autism and she's shown that there's a whole lot of genes that change and that are related to autism in the fetus. Very, very few or many fewer uh, in the brain and, and adults and that there are some here that are actually the same in the fetus and the adult and these ones here and these ones in black they actually do something weird because the switch works to turn the gene on in the fetus and turn the gene off in the adult and that's pretty cool but we don't understand that much yet either but what we do know is that genes and the proteins they encode work in pathways and that if you mess up a pathway just like the lights in that you can't see down the tunnel, right? If you break a light in the middle of the tunnel, you can't see to the end. And so we know that. Now what we've been doing and trying to do is understand how variants work together. Because if the variants have these impacts on genes and they put them in pathways, then basically what will happen is we go through either a pathway which is specific to anxiety and gives you anxiety specific effects, or one which is specific to schizophrenia and gives you schizophrenia effects. But there will be some changes that actually cause shared pathways and they're affecting the same pathways and these are working together. And these ones we think give the shared characteristics of these disorders which occur together. And so this is to show that and this is beautiful work by Shremol. Um, and basically what this shows, this is actually about um, aging and grip strength. And so all of these ones that are coloured here are affected by one of these different disorders. It's either grip strength with ageing because when you get past 40 um, basically you start losing muscle mass uh, and you start losing grip strength, about 10% per decade, um, unless you keep using it, and even then you keep losing it. Um, and that's there. But there are genetic variants that are associated with the rate at which you lose your strength. Myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, all right, these are the colours. And they affect genes across this, but the unfortunate thing is that if you have all of these ones in purple that are linked to grip strength, and then you happen to have the multiple sclerosis ones that target here, then effectively you really mess up this part of your pathway. This part down here, you don't affect so badly, but this part you really mess up. And so understanding this and the relationship between these we think is very, very important. So what we don't want to do is treat people as if one person is the same as everybody else. We don't want to squish everyone into a box. So we really want to move to understanding things from a personal perspective. Because we can sequence everybody's genomes now. We can do it reasonably cheaply. So Tayaza, um, Nick, and Rowan here um, are all starting to do this on different disorders. Uh, Parkinson's, um, Rowan's, uh, sorry, Nick is doing several, and Rowan is doing asthma. But just in the, in the last few minutes, apparently I'm allowed to speak for as long as I want, but, um, <laughs> <coughs> but I won't. Um, in the last few minutes, I've got to talk about the microbiome because it's been an amazing trip. Um, so we have many genomes. We're not just the genomes I've talked about. You know, we have about 23,000 genes ourselves, uh, but microbial genes, we have about 2 million. Um, that's 43% human, okay? And most of you is not human. Most of you lives in here, and this is someone's actual gut, um, and so most of you lives in here, and in fact in this part here, through here. About 1 to 2 kilograms, approximately the same size as your liver, of that is microbial mass bacteria, protozoa, various other organisms, and they live there. And it's not a case of us and them, okay, for a long time we thought it was us and them, and it's a competition between us and them. But in fact, if you don't have these bacteria in your gut, your gut doesn't develop properly. If you don't have it in your gut, and you, for example, you have a mouse that doesn't have any bacteria in it, and you can create those, you stick them in a bubble, and then you breed them, and you treat them very specially. But if you do that, they have very, very weird gut structures. All right? And they have a lot of immune inflammation and things that are happening. Because they're used to interacting with the bacteria that they have in their stomachs. We are used to it. We have evolved with these bacteria and it's important for us. For our health, well-being, longevity, all these things. So, it's not us and them, but it should be more this sort of interaction. And so there's a lot of different ones and we're interested in various aspects of these. And, you know, uh, Tommy is, is really focusing on these phage here um, and bits and pieces. But Wayne and I started working on this um, some time ago. And so we started out um, thinking about how early life events affect the development of the microbiome. And 
it was really simple because we think that changes that occur when you're born, in the microbiome when you're born, maybe they affect you when you're a bit older, in childhood. So we got a cohort together of children who had been born at less than 32 weeks gestation, um, so very early preterm children, uh, and compared those to children who had been born at term. But we didn't do it when they were born, we did it when they were about eight years of age, okay, and walking around in the community. And these kids we showed, and Tommy and, and Fellini showed, really beautifully um, are actually different. Not the bacteria, but the little viruses that live on the bacteria. The kids who were born preterm and who went through the, the whole neonatal intensive care unit had way fewer bacteriophage in their system, way fewer bacterial viruses in their system than the kids who didn't. This is eight years after they were born. And this is pretty important. We don't really understand it yet, but what we think might be happening, now this figure was drawn by my daughter actually, uh, which is really cool, um, but what we think is happening is that when they're born, because they're kept in this kind of environment, this special environment, right, to keep them alive, which is amazing. But because they're in that environment, they're not getting enough microbes. And so the phage that they're exposed to just go through because there's nothing for them to live in. And so the phage, and the viruses, basically, their population level crashes because they don't have the prey to prey on. It's like if you had a, 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 a park full of lions and there were no gazelles in there, right, well, the lion population is going to crash because it can't eat the gazelles. Right? Same deal. The viruses are going into the system. There's no bacteria, nothing for them to eat. Their population crashes. And then that's what we think, um, but we'll probably be wrong. Maybe one day we'll find out. <laughs> um, and this is what we did at the same time. And so Flynn did this, and this was with Billy. Uh, this is great. Um, and so with Billy, Billy kept an artwork. Um, and in this artwork, Billy had a sample uh, stored from 40 years ago um, of his morning stool. And, you know, nobody else has done that and kept that. Um, it's, it's quite remarkable um, all this time that Billy's done that. And so Billy was kind enough to let us sample that and compare it to what we find from current day samples. And so what we did is we, we did that and we extracted that. And uh, this is it compared here. And so these three samples here are Billy's samples. These samples are all from um, people pretty much in the US. Um, and so at the time when Billy made these samples, he was living in the US and this matches really nicely with the population from the US. And what we did then was that we took samples from Billy uh, much, much later on, 40 years later, and we looked at those samples. In fact, those samples now sit way down here, okay, way away from this population here. And that's a really interesting thing because we know that the microbiome changes over your lifetime. It drifts. It changes as a result of all the events and things that we have. But there was a graph that some guys had done, um, Faith and colleagues, oh, I haven't got their name up here, sorry, but they had generated this on the basis of an early set of samples out to five years, and they'd extrapolated it out to 50. And we thought, oh, that's cool, because Billy actually gave us the samples that were 46 years apart. We thought, oh, well, do they fit on this graph? And in fact, this graph is amazing, right? Because um, out here, this is the amount of similarity between Billy's samples and if it's right inside the confidence interval on this graph, right, so this is a pretty much a good prediction. So if you want to see what your microbiome is going to look like now, sequence it, drift it about 45 years, and, and you'll know. It follows a relationship. But Wayne and I were thinking about this, and you know, we thought, what if we can do this? The microbiome changes over your lifetime. It changes all the time, right? We can manipulate it. And so we thought, well, let's see what we can do. So we came up with this idea that turned into the Gut Bugs project, uh, which was, you might know, is the good shit, um, which is on TV. Uh, and these are the people that really did all the work, um, here, Karen and Fellini. But this is the, st the study. And what we did was we thought, right, let's take obese uh, uh, adolescents and transfer microbiomes from healthy people into them. And of course, you can't do that using this, right? And no one's going to eat that. Um, and you can't do it using this, right? <clears throat> because no one's going to drink that, all right? It's simple. So what we did is we put it inside some capsules. All right? And these capsules, they don't taste, they don't smell. You can't see any color or anything, and they're pretty cool. And we fed these to a, a large number of people, and that was amazing. Um, so we fed them to these people, uh, and we looked at their changes over six months. And in fact, what we found was that at six weeks, um, the people who had metabolic syndrome, which is a series of about five different measures, which are showing changes in the system that are predisposing towards 
diabetes. We showed that those people that had that when they went into the study and had the FMT, that they actually reverted from this, and I'll call it pre-diabetic sort of condition, although that's not strictly true, but pre-diabetic condition um, as a result of that FMT. And there's been a lot of work done on this and carrying on with this, because the cool thing was that our FMT was actually a competition experiment, because we gave these people the microbes from four different people and effectively let them compete in the individuals as if the individuals are incubators. And it's really neat because what Brooke has shown and Tommy are that in fact there's a whole range of ways that their microbiomes changed. That some people gained new organisms from the donors and we can finger that exactly. We can fingerprint the bacteria. We know it's exactly the one that came from the donor. It went into the recipient it took in the recipient and it stayed in the recipient for up to six months, right? It changed their microbiome. So the microbiomes that we were feeding were actually able to manipulate and change the microbiomes in these people for a long period of time. And this is really cool because this opens up whole new avenues for therapies and things when we understand which organisms are critical for making those changes. And this has, of course, led to the new study that we're doing uh, a series of studies we're going to do now, um, again, um, supported by the Rockfield Trust, um, but it's going in, it's, it's gut bugs too, and we're going to look at various other conditions and run those through shortly. But just to finish, the future is, is a weird thing, you know, and what we want to do in the future is to use your DNA and that of your microbiome to increase well-being and health. We don't want to use your DNA just for your ancestry or your 23andMe. We don't want to use your DNA to reconstruct the image of your face, even though, well, we can. This is a computer generation from a DNA sequence, and this is the actual lady that that DNA sequence came from. And this is the same for a bloke. Um, so you can do it. Um, we don't want to do that. The information's there, but that's not what we want. What we want to understand is how we can apply this to diagnose people who are critically ill and treat people that are critically ill. And so Frank and I um, and Stephen Robertson and people from the hospital um, and hospitals across the country are trying to set up a study now basically to do rapid sequencing of critically ill children and their parents to identify the changes that are specific to the child link that information back to the clinicians along with any potential information that allows them to treat the children so that the clinicians can make a decision as to how they treat the children going forward. There are a large number of conditions where if you supplement something very quickly, particularly a lot of um, um, epilepsy conditions, where there's about 130 different presentations of epilepsy in children, if you do that in those children, you can stop neurodegeneration and long-term developmental effects, and it's really important. And so we're trying to do this now. We know it works um, in other places around the world. We want to do it. Um, so this is Frank and Stephen here. Um, but we believe also that including mutations that are outside of the genes, which we've been talking about tonight, um, how we can interpret those, and also your microbiome may be very important for this. So to finish, uh, I just want to say thank you very much to these people. This is my current lab group. Minus a, a couple of people, um, unfortunately, who weren't at the picture. Um, but I want to thank them all very much. Uh, it's, it's, it's truly a pleasure and honour to work with you all. Uh, and I want to leave it with my son <laughs> some time ago, uh, which is, uh, yeah, from the mouth to the end again. <laughs> thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you.